Hello, welcome, welcome back, actually. Uh, we've been absent for a few weeks, but uh, we stockpiled some guests uh, for future, and it's not often that I get uh, the opportunity to welcome an FA Cup winning manager, a current FA Cup winning manager, no less, the Sheffield, uh, well, former Sheffield United striker Gareth Taylor, in the headlines recently, the head coach of Manchester City Women, who've lifted the Women's FA Cup, beating Everton at Wembley. There's lots to talk about, both the men's and the women's game. Hello, Gareth. How are you? Hi, Alan. Yeah, very good, thanks. Thank you. It's such an exciting time for you. Yeah, yeah. Busy time. Um, you know, it was a difficult transition for me, kind of taking on a new job in lockdown. I don't think there were many other, uh, especially in the sporting world, where that happened. So um, that brought with it its kind of complexities. But... Um, yeah, it's been great. Obviously, we're really fortunate that we're able to go back doing what we, we love and enjoy. And, um, you know, the only sacrifice, obviously, is is not having the fans in the stadium. So Wembley was kind of like a great experience last week, but also a bit of a strange one as well. And I know how seriously that top football clubs take women's football now, hence your presence as a head coach there and the massive strides that are being taken. And by the way, later in part two, you'll be joined by Carla Ward, uh, former Sheffield United uh, ladies manager and now in charge of Birmingham City, no less than the manager of the month in the FA Women's Super League. So the, the sport really, I, I was not, not the sport, but the, the women's side of it is taking off such big style, uh, Gareth. Yes, it is. And, and rightly so. And it's, it's taken some time. And I've been fortunate enough to kind of witness it at close quarters, working at City in the academy for, you know, six, seven years, seeing how the the women's team at City grew um, from very much kind of part-time into a full-time model. And uh, now, obviously, the amount of exposure, um, which is increasing, you know, month by month in the game, is is only healthy. Do you do you see it as, as a route to management in, in the male game? Or do you see it as a job in its own right and a future in its own right, managing a, a, a top at a top club, the women's team? I just see it as management, you know, the same as I see coaching. You know, I don't really see anything at all in, in coaching men, uh, boys, women, young girls. For me, it's, it's the same. So management is management for me. You still, um, there's so many, so many things that overlap. There's so many similarities. You're still coaching in the same way. You're still focusing on on performances, you're focusing on fixtures that you've got coming up in the same way. Um, and the the whole kind of football world and how it runs is is exactly the same for me. Well, we'll talk also about your your career your, uh, as, as time goes on. We'll come back to the women's side before we do that. Um, Pep Guardiola, now there's a huge personality. Does he, t does he take an interest? Is there any kind of overlap between you and him? In what you do in your job? Yeah, I mean, it's um, we're very we're very close in terms of proximity. So you know, if anyone's not not sure, um, our CFA Academy houses obviously the men's first team, the women's first team, um, the lone players, and all the academy products from under twenty threes down to under eights. Um, yeah. Also uh, houses the community uh, and everything else that goes on there. So it's a very you know, it's like a, a mini city, really, that place of uh, football non-stop um, interactions. And yeah, the, the manager's been great. You know, uh, lots of messages to me uh, in lockdown when I first took the job. Um, uh, before and after Wembley, like amazing. And um, actually, because of we, we are in close proximity in terms of where we're, where we're stationed at the academy. But, um, you know, we do come into contact occasionally and the... One of the first things he said to me, I think I bumped into about three weeks ago, one of the first things he said was, you know, when's the final? So for him to take an interest like that is is amazing. And, um, you know, he was really supportive of the previous coach, Nick Cushion, and he's continued that with myself, which is which is great. Well, we all know uh, Pep's uh, celestial brand of football and the celestial players he has, of course. Is there any kind of template within... Manchester City for you, for you not so much to replicate it, but to go down similar lines in, in, in what you're try, trying to achieve and the way that you do it. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, I'm first and foremost, I'm a huge fan of, of Pep 
and and the way he's coached his teams, you know, various teams that he's coached over the years, you know, he's a he's a real kind of uh, strong example for me and and someone that um, I really buy into his his methods. Um, yeah, and we and we try to, you know, there will be some similarities in the way we work. There'll be some similarities in the way we play. And you know, I always said when I took this job that you know I understand the the winning environment and that we need to be successful and we need to win trophies unfortunately we started really well with the trophy um but i think for me it's more about how we do those things and how we play our football um and sometimes when things don't go your way like it happens to all of us coaches that you pride yourself on the performance and i think that's always always key sometimes you'll play really well and and you don't get the result you need and sometimes you won't play so well but take a result you know, that's football. It's, it never changes. Indeed. Well, we're going to talk about Sheffield United's Pep Guardiola in a moment because uh, you've had plenty of associations with Mr Chris Wilder down the years. But before yeah. that, uh, for anybody uh, uninitiated in this, I mean, Gareth Taylor, a striker, who uh, a tall striker, a big striker, but I thought a, more of a cultured sort of centre-forward. He played for... Nine clubs, plus a further five, I think it was, on loan. 642 appearances, 135 goals, ranging from Bristol Rovers, I think you're from down there, uh, through Crystal Palace, Sheffield United, Manchester City, Burnley, Nottingham Forest, Tranmere, Doncaster and Wrexham. I don't think I've missed anybody out. Plus 15 caps for Wales. But that period specifically at Sheffield United... 1996 to 98, which I remember. I think you were signed by Howard Kendall, uh, one yeah. of the absolute greats of the game. And it was a very eventful time, uh, Gareth. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's. Um, I, I'd come off a tough period of, you know, I did really well at my local club at Bristol Rovers. I moved for a big money move to Crystal Palace, um, which didn't work out for me. I left within a year of signing a three-year contract there. Um and I always say that Sheffield United was kind of like my salvation. I, uh, the minute I walked in and, and spoke to Howard, I knew this is where I wanted to be. And, um, you know, there was a great period in my life. I, you know, the, the setup there, the, the dressing room was amazing. We had some great characters in there. I struck up an immediate friendship with Don Hutchinson. We were in the hotel together. He just signed. And, um, you know, I really warmed to Howard. He, he had a, just a way with the players where whether you were playing or not playing, you really felt a part of the team. And he, he tried to create this team unity. And, um, you know, we, we we had a really good team. We Then, obviously, I, I played under a, a few different managers there and the team changed a lot. Um, and, you know, at one point, I think, under Nigel Spackman, we took over after Howard. Um we, we seem to really push the boat out in terms of signings and looking back on old team photos, when you see that pre-season, I think it was of um, maybe 90, 97, 98. Uh, that was a really good team, really good team, but you know, great times. I love my time in Sheffield. I, you know, I had my first child there and um, we were really settled uh, and I've made so many friends from, from that period of time. Yeah, I remember it really was a fabulous team that uh, was inherited and built on by Nigel Spackman from Howard Kendall. And mm. after that, Steve Thompson, I think you you got to the playoffs two successive years. But what really dismantled it, what every Blades fan who can remember that era uh, reflects on, is the sale on the same day uh, of Brian, both Brian Dean and Jan Fjortoft. I mean, what, mm. what are your memories of that? And how deflating was it, really? Yeah, I mean, at the time we, you know, we had quite, we had a big squad and it was difficult trying to keep players happy. So, you know, as well as Jan and Brian, um, you know, there was myself, um, Graham Stewart was playing at the time, Dean Saunders was there. Um, so, although we knew we had like strength in depth, losing two players of, of that ilk is, was a big one, you know. So, I think you've probably seen over over periods of time in history with clubs where they really pushed the boat out to make a push of it and try and get that promotion. And it didn't happen for us. We got so close. And then obviously on the back back end of that, it starts to be right. We've got to, we've got to trim the wage bill here. So, or, or bring in some money. And obviously the club looked at doing that um, in that period. 
Yeah, indeed. And uh, it was the start of a decline, uh, really. But you did have those memories. I mean, you did, you did go to a playoff final, albeit a losing one. Uh, David Hopkins, I think, in the last minute for... Yeah, uh, against my old team, time. Palace, where I just yeah. left. Yeah. You just left. I mean, you yeah. didn't have much luck with playoffs, did you? And then the following season, you got to the semi-finals of the playoffs under Steve Thompson, who I still yeah. see regularly when I go to games at Lincoln. And you lost yeah. to Sunderland, I think. And then you go That's to Manchester right. under Joe Royal. More playoffs. Yeah, yeah. And and 2-0 down in that final against Gillingham for Man City, I was looking at three on the banks. I'd already been in the playoffs with Bristol Rovers. We lost to Huddersfield. The Palace one we've spoken about. And then, you know, obviously uh, City v Gillingham. And, but we managed to turn it around. And and then I had one further one at Doncaster when we beat Leeds. So I my record was four playoff finals, two wins, two losses. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was an eventful time. And, you know, I... You know, like I say, great memories of that dressing room, some really good players, you know, worked for some really good coaches. And, um, you know, I, I when I go back to the lane where possible, um, I was I was back quite a bit last season before lockdown um, due to Chris being there, because you feel like there's a real connection there with with someone like Chris, who's now manager of the club and doing so well, um, who's a fan of the club. As a former player of the club on on two occasions, um, and you know, and I think that is, I think for the supporters and the people of Sheffield, it's a real connection there with Chris. Indeed, and and you go back. Uh, I hadn't realised until we we chatted just before. I did know that you were briefly uh, teammates uh, during during your spell at uh, Bramall Lane as a player, but I didn't know that the connection with Chris Wilder went back a lot lot f- further than that. Yeah, don't ask me for the year, but we must be going back for 30, over 30 years ago. I was literally signing for Southampton uh, as a youngster and um, doing my scholarship from 16 to 18. And I was moving into a house in uh, Bitten and there were two players in there who were moving out. Um, Chris was a year or two older than me, so he was uh, moving out of the the digs and I was moving into it. So we literally had a quick conversation. He was walking out with boxes. I was walking in with boxes of clothes and um, well, our paths crossed again when I was then back playing for Bristol Rovers. He was playing for Rotherham and we had a conversation about that, that moment. And then uh, eventually he arrived back at, at Bramall Lane for his second spell. And I was there and we played together for a short period, but became a real good friend of mine. Chris came to my, my wedding and, um, you know, we've kept in contact uh, ever since. We did some of our coaching licenses together as well. So, um, you know, I always look at Chris as a real good example for any any coach to aspire to because, you know, he's he's getting all the adulation and everything now of being a Premier League manager, but he really did the hard yards, you know, of, of coaching in the lower leagues. And, you know, he earned his stripes, so to speak. Yeah, and, and although he's going through a difficult period at the moment, you know, you, you get asked some silly questions uh, sometimes. And uh, I was chatting on the radio uh, this week, actually, and somebody asked me if Chris Wilder was under pressure. And I, I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Come on. <laughs> well, this is the game we live in, isn't it? It's um, You're never far away from being the best coach in the world to being the worst in, in some people's minds. It's a game of opinions. It never changes. And... I think Chris is uh, solid in his beliefs and, and his perspective on things, and the people around him are be um, the people around him are be the most important people to him. And, and I think you know sometimes supporters can get a little bit carried away, and and uh, and I always say to him, be careful what you wish for, because you know the club should be really delighted that they've got Chris, you know, one of their own, done amazing, took him up you know, double promotions into the Premier League, had an outstanding season last season. And with that comes expectation. And now all of a sudden, because they're not picking up results, I'm sure Chris had just looked to their performances and their performances have been pretty good from box to box. And that's where the game never changes. He'll, uh, he'll be fine. Um, but again, yeah, hopefully there's some kind of sense of, uh, uh, the word I'm looking for is like, um, Realism. Realism. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well, you, you do hope so. In, in some ways, you know, managers can be a victim of their own success. And, you know, I've got a personal thought that possibly the worst thing that could have happened is finishing ninth last season. Uh, yeah. You know, well, it, could have been be- it could have been better than that. Yeah, it could have been better. A little better but, than that, didn't it? Yeah. 
but it's lifted what, what the, the word you've just used. It's lifted expectations beyond a realistic level because I think realistically, simply staying in the Premier League is where it's at at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's huge, isn't it? You know, the financial side of things, and you know, you look at the the quality of the clubs in the Championship, and everyone's striving to get there. And you know, Fulham got there last season uh, into the Premier League this season, and all of a sudden they're finding out what it's all about and how difficult it is. And you know, um, when you look at the, the the squad that Chris has got, you know, he's he's taken a few years to build that squad, and you know they've not had fortunes to go and spend. They've not got carried away with being in the Premier League. Um, and I think, like you said, I think it's just about people being calm now and just uh, supporting the team as much as they can because uh, I'm sure they'll be fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, give us an insight into. Uh, what it was like as uh, you two possibly being two young tearaways uh, together at Southampton. Well, at least I know one of them would have been a tearaway. I don't know you so well there, uh, Gareth. Uh, I, I'm sure you uh, you enjoyed life to the full. That, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were good days, and and I mean, even when we came together to to play at um, at the Blades, you know, Chris was uh, he was great company, and um, you know, he was a great teammate as well. He uh, played in various positions at that point for the club. And um, he'd obviously had a relationship with Steve Thompson previously. I think they played in the same team together, him and Tomo. And then eventually Tomo got the job and, you know, took us on that run to the semi-finals of the FA Cup, where we got beat by Newcastle. And then obviously the playoffs, like you mentioned, against Sunderland. Um, but yeah, Chris was was great. Great to have in the dressing room. Um was never far away from being at the centre of it on a night out. And, you know, we we used to frequent uh, Ecclesaw Road quite a bit. Um, ah. So they were good times. Yeah, Ecclesaw Road has got some stories to tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> any definitely. That are, <laughs> any that are tellable? <laughs> um, there was... There was a funny one, actually, where I, I'm sure me and Chris were injured and uh, Steve Bruce was the manager and he'd... Uh, He'd set up like um, an away day. So I think the lads went clay pigeon shooting um, and quad biking. But the injured weren't allowed to come, which like straight away, it was like, come on, me and Chris were injured. So we had our own kind of uh, get together, Ecclesaw Road in the afternoon. And then the lads met up with us later that evening. But telling us some of the stories uh, uh, from Steve Bruce were, were hilarious. You know, I think at the time we had a player I think we had a player called John Cullen who was really struggling to find form. We brought him in and um, Steve being Steve, you know, he was like, uh, he's a great character, Brucey, where he'd be like in with the, with the lads trying to have the crack. And he was, uh, I think some of the lads were off quad biking and uh, I think it was Marcello who was on one of the quad bikes and he actually thought it was John Cullen. Some of the lads who were clay pigeon shooting here and he said, is that, is that John Cullen I can see over there on the far field? He went, someone give me a shotgun like that. And literally John Cullen stood behind him. <laughs> it was Marcello on the bike. So he's gone like, what, what do you mean? What do you mean, Gaffer? Oh, I saw you there, John. You know, And then the lads were ribbing him. But they're obviously coming back and telling us these stories to me and Chris. And uh, yeah, it was, it was fun times. It was real eventful times. Because Steve, to be fair to him, he just finished playing himself. You know, he had an illustrious uh, career. And um, he started off as... If you remember, he started off as player manager in that period. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, like I say, we talked about transitions before. It was a tough one for him. It certainly was. And uh, I was in touch with him before he, he got that job and during the time. And he was extremely good to deal with, as he's always been. But I remember his absolute frustration uh, with the fact that he had something like three chairmen to deal with. It wasn't just one. Yeah. The club was, you know, the club was an absolute mess, wasn't it, off the field? I don't know how uh, aware you and other players were about that. A little bit, yeah, because I had to have some dealings um, with Charles Green, if you remember Charles. Um, so at the time, I had a couple of opportunities to, one was to, to go and play for Utrecht, um, which came about, it was so strange how it came about. And there was another opportunity to play for Genoa in Italy. And I was like, where are these where are these moves kind of coming from? I'm happier at the club. I was enjoying my football. Um, and uh, yeah, so I had, I had my dealings with these, with these people. And sometimes like, whether that was Nigel or Steve, they didn't really know what was, what was kind of going on above them. Um, so yeah, it was, 
kind of uh, difficult times because in I think previously when Howard was there, we never felt that we had that. We felt like Howard was had his finger on the pulse with everything. Um, you know, there was none of that going on. He was in control of a lot of things. Um, so, and it was really difficult for Nigel and really difficult for Steve as well. I can imagine they would have been really frustrated in that period. Yeah, it was a, a, an absolute circus of, of a fiasco. The club seems a bit more together now, which is a good thing. Um, Coming back to the, the women's game, I mean, you had last weekend a, an incredible result, uh, a, a record, a club record uh, victory, eight goals to one over Bristol City. You were sort of coming from d- down that way. You, m- you, must have been, you must have really enjoyed that. Yeah, well, I played for the Rovers. So if anyone is from the Bristol area, they know that you're either red or blue. And um, so, yeah, it was, a nice, it was a nice victory. Yeah, the girls did great. Um, we've been... We've been looking like clicking into that kind of scoreline quite a few times already this season and it hasn't happened for one reason or another. So it was nice to get a few goals under our belt and, in, and improve the, uh, the goal difference in the league. Yeah, including goals, I think, from Lucy Bronze and Ellen White, uh, two England stars, just representative of the kind of quality there that, that you're coaching. Yeah, we have a lot of England players. Um, you know, we're fortunate that we... Or that we have a lot of uh, quality in the squad. We have, you know, two players who've won the World Cup with America, um, Rose Lavelle and Sam Mewis, who are in our squad this season. So it's great. Um, international duty is next week for our girls and literally we'll lose about 11 or 12 players that go off with England. Um, so you can see that uh, the quality is there and, you know, the competition for places is really there as well this season, which is important. There's been a real continuity for you on the uh, coaching front because actually, uh, I think I'm right in saying you, you, you've been with Manchester City uh, behind the scenes since 2011. Uh, mm. And you've you, you built up to this. You've done various, various other roles. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, just various other roles in the academy. Um, I was basically looking, I was in a coaching role for young uh, Emirati players from, from Abu Dhabi at first. Um, and then basically I, I worked my way into the under-16 coach at the academy, which was at the old academy then at Platt Lane in Moss Side. Um, we moved six years ago to the new academy, the new academy site, and then progressed to uh, under-18 coach uh, and did two seasons, two, two and a half seasons at that as well. So, um, yeah, great experiences. Worked with, you know, so many very good players, Um Play, you know, the under 16 role was a key one because you had to kind of uh, that was a key decision where you were kind of taking players on or or you weren't their, their journey ended at, at City and then you had to look at fixing them up uh, at other clubs. So that was a that was a tough role and a role where you had to have really good relationships with other clubs. Uh, as an example, you know, I worked with David Brooks and I remember sorting Brooksy out to go to Sheffield United um, and obviously he went on from there and was ended up playing in the Premier League and for Wales as well. So, you know, it's you get some real good stories like that um, where potentially there's not the opportunity to progress at this club, but you take great pride still in a, in a young player making his name elsewhere. Oh, he's done fantastically well, both at Sheffield United and at Bournemouth, and he's linked quite heavily by me, uh, among others, with possibly a move back to Bramall Lane at some point. I won't ask you about that, but just close to close part one. Um, got to say to you, uh, in researching this, I noticed, and this is something I wasn't aware of at the time, uh, 2001, it says in, on Wikipedia that you almost joined Sheffield, Sheffield Wednesday after a £100,000 fee was agreed. Is, is that, was that true? Nah, that's the first I've heard of that. What club was what? I at? 2000? I would have been at Man City. I left. Man- yeah. What club well, this- was I at? Man City or um, Man City? Birmingham. You'd have been at Manchester City. Uh, so uh, I don't trust a... Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia, Alan, I wouldn't trust it. Well, there's a lesson for us Some all. Of the things of... that get put in on there. A bit of mischief. I wouldn't be surprised if a Sheffield Wednesday fan put that in. You see, <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I thought, seeing that, I've got to ask Gareth about that because I can't remember anything about it. But absolute nonsense. Anyway, we'll move on into part two. We'll take a short break. In part two, delighted to say we'll be joined by the FA Women's Super League Manager of the Month, a real friend of the show because she's appeared two or three times previously, 
Carla Ward with Gareth Taylor in a couple of minutes. We'll see you then.